Everybody? I think we're ready, we're getting, letting everybody get settled from their last run at the bar. <laughs> Wait a minute, the dean doesn't have, have a glass. What, what's wrong? We're Penn Staters, we're supposed, to, <laughs> we're supposed to make sure everybody has their hands full. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Ballou, class of 1990, a graduate of the College of Communications. It was a school, the, it was a brand new school of communications when I was a freshman in 1985. I'm glad to see that it has grown. Uh, I am a news editor with Al Jazeera English uh, here in Washington. I'm one of the, in fact, part of the first class of hires nine years ago. And we've, my, how we've grown with multiple channels and and some things you read about us are, are interesting and good, and some things are a bit challenging lately, <laughs> about our, especially about our baby sister channel, but we won't get into that tonight. Uh, I'm also, I, but I have a couple of hats tonight. I'm welcoming you, as a, uh, those of you who are alumni and faculty and friends, as, as, as an alum, and also my other hat as vice chair of the Board of Governors of the National Press Club. And it's my privilege, I think, that things like, things like a Penn State education prepares you for things like this. Uh, so if you have the right footing and the right guidance and the right friends and faculty and alumni, uh, you, can, you too can run a hundred and something year old press club. Uh, but I, I'll be brief because I wanted to, I have two introductions to make tonight. One is to the club president. Who, John Hughes, who will give you the, a more formal welcome to the club, and, and then I will have the privilege of introducing our relatively new dean, Marie Harden, and get on with the program so we can all love on Neiman Reports and, and uh, give them the, the lovely hardware and, and have our, our robust annual discussion that we've had here uh, at least since the, what, 94? Uh, that we've been doing this, and, and we're going to have a great time tonight. Please take advantage, walk around the club, enjoy the place, and if you haven't, and you'll hear this from John too, if you've never considered membership in the National Press Club, uh, I would be happy to co-sponsor your membership. Uh, so with that, I w it's my privilege to introduce the, uh, the breaking news editor for Bloomberg News, uh, here in Washington, and the current president is the 107th president of the national, uh, 108th, excuse me, 108th president of the National Press Club, my good friend and board colleague, John Hughes. Thank you so much. The funny thing about being the 108th president, you know, the club was founded 108 years ago, and I know from the plaques upstairs that some of the early presidents served for two or three years at a time, yet they call me the 108th president. That doesn't quite work, but you know what they say about journalists and math, so we're just going to let that go. I do want to welcome you to this event tonight, and I'm so glad you're here, and congratulations to the Neiman folks in the audience. Neiman folks, congratulations. Very happy for you. And uh, just need to confess that I went to the University of Minnesota, Big Ten rival. I think we won the last time we played football. Didn't did Minnesota win? Does anybody remember that? I don't want to bring up a hard subject, but uh, as a Minnesotan, as, as a Minnesotan, of course, I'm excited because I don't know if you noticed on the board out front, Garrison Keeler is going to be here tomorrow, and he's going to do a press club luncheon. And you know the last time that Garrison Keeler was here? 1994. So it's been 21 years since we've had him. He was here three times before 94 and uh, hasn't been here in 21 years, so we're very excited. And we're going to find out where Lake Wobegon is on this presidential election. Are they with Hillary? Uh, are they worried about the email scandal? We're going to get to the bottom of that at tomorrow's event. But the significance, of course, in mentioning Garrison Keillor in 1994 is 1994 was the year that you started this award and you announced it here at the National Press Club. And I was talking with the dean 
before this event, and she thinks it's happened here basically every year since then. I mean, maybe there was a year here or there that it wasn't held here, but that's a great record. And I just want to thank you for holding this event. Thank you, Penn State, for being so loyal to the National Press Club with this event. We're very happy to have you, and what better place to hold it, right? This is really the shrine to good journalism not only in Washington, but I think the world. I, I really don't think there is a better place to honor great journalism than the National Press Club. So welcome to you, congratulations, and again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you John. We have a, m a multitude of events, so John has to dash off on, across the hall. One, one of my former colleagues from the White House press corps from the 90s when I was reporting on the Clinton administration, Connie Lawn has her memoir uh, out and has a book signing across, across the hall. So there are several of us board members sort of floating around tonight and, and so we'll be in and out and hopefully catch the discussion here. Uh, as I look at the, at, at the plaque tonight, uh, I'm slightly partial to things Boston because I spent a part of my career there at WCVB, so I know a little about Harvard and a little about Neiman and of a lot of colleagues who have gone, have, who are Neiman Fellows and, and whatnot. In fact, but last year, my old boss, Emily Rooney, won this award last year. So uh, I, so something about Boston and back-to-back -back things and, well, you know, sports and, well, we won't get into that. I'm from Pittsburgh, so what do I know about Boston sports? But it's, my, it's actually my privilege to uh, reacquaint, with, uh, reacquaint you with, with, for some of you to become reacquainted with and for many of you uh, to be introduced for the first time here at the National Press Club as Dean of the College of Communications, uh, Marie Harden, who joined the faculty in 2003 and has uh, cut a very nice, uh, vigorous path of helping the co our, my former, our former college grow, uh, helping her st her, her, you know, students compete and win in the Hearst competition, helping us raise even more money in scholarships, helping us, I'm sure there's always more in that department, uh, helping us just simply become a better college and overall making Penn State a better university. I don't know how much you know about our, our new dean, other than the fact that she misses teaching now that she has to spend more time behind a desk. Uh, she did an interview with, with my good friend and former trustee Mimi Copper, Coppersmith Fredman, and sorry, I left out the younger. Uh, and one of the things I, I thought about when I was reading through various interviews with, with, with her is that she loves the idea of the academy and making sure students learn, making sure they grow, making sure they prosper, making sure that incredible issues in our profession are actually attended to. One of the things that, that if you've seen her in action, a, is that she cares deeply about uh, women in sports journalism. And I, and I have a particular eye on this because one of my classmates, um, Lisa Salters on ESP, of ESPN fame, who played basketball at Penn State and of course went on to become a uh, correspondent for, e, for E60 and Monday Night Football and everything else that you've seen, uh, these are, these are critical issues of our time, and she's not afraid to tackle them. And these are, this is the kind of leadership that we need at Penn State, somebody who's not afra afraid to tackle the tough issues and speak out about them and make sure our, our future colleagues uh, are armed with the, with the tools to be great journalists and great communicators overall. So besides, Miss, besides missing teaching, besides being across uh, women in journalism, did you know that she loves to run? Uh, she loves marathons. And so I, John and, and Marie and I were talking on the other side of the room. We're going to have to get her back down here for the National Press Club 5K for scholarship in September. 
5K is breakfast for her. <laughs> so, so we'll make sure that you come back down and, and uh, don a bib and, and run it in what, 10 minutes flat and while the rest of us are huffing and puffing around, around the Capitol. But with that, I'm, I'm pleased to see that, 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 that my alma mater and my college is in great hands and uh, which, which will probably encourage me to write a check at some point in the near future. But with that, all of that said, I want to introduce to all of you uh, and reintroduce you to some, our Dean, Marie Harden. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Uh, for being here tonight. You know, this is the college's final big event for the 2014-15 academic year. So this is it's my first year as dean. This is my final big event for this academic, my first academic uh, year. And you know, we're always grateful to end on such an incredibly high note. Uh, we have alumni here, I see, from across the decades. Uh, and we're also joined appropriately by a few Neiman Fellows, including my husband, Jerry Kammer, a 1993-94 Neiman Fellow. We also have college faculty and staff here with us, including Russ Eshelman, interim head of our journalism department. Journalism remains the largest major in the college. And uh, more than 700 students, many of them aspiring journalists, joined our alumni ranks less than two weeks ago at our commencement. And you know, it was so exciting for me, the ceremony capped another great year for the college. For instance, as you all know, we followed our three-year run as national champions in the William Randolph Hearst Journalism Awards Program with an eighth place national finish overall. It's an incredible top 10 streak that the college continues to have in the most prestigious of all college journalism competitions. You might not know this, our student-run newscast center county report won a national collegiate emmy award and that's a first for the college the nittany group our student advertising team won third place in the american advertising federation's regional competition in new york city and a class public relations campaign to quote make happy valley happier i don't know how happy valley could be any happier won a Gold Hermes Creative Award, making this year the third year in a row for student campaigns in the college to win this prestigious honor. Now, as you all know, I could go on, but I know I'm preaching to the choir. You know that as the largest nationally accredited College of Communications in the US, we are home to so many talented students who excel with the guidance of our dedicated and experienced faculty and we continue to expand the opportunities for our students. Perhaps you've heard about our new internship program in Los Angeles next spring. We had 116 applicants for 12 slots. Talk about a response. And as I speak, seven students are completing documentary projects in Amsterdam as part of an advanced course in our film video program. So lots going on. But of course, we're here at the Press Club tonight to recognize, as we do each year, the kind of work to which our best students aspire. The Bart Richards Award for Media Crit Criticism was made possible through the generosity of Penn State alumnus George T. Richards and his wife, Anne. George is a retired president and CEO of Vitex Packaging Incorporated in Granby, Connecticut and is the managing director of Richards Associates, a commercial real estate firm in Granby. George has been honored as a dis Penn State Distinguished Alumnus, the highest honor bestowed by the Board of Trustees, and he has been a generous supporter of the university, including through his support of a Civil War era center at Penn State, which is recognized nationally as a leader in Civil War era scholarship. His daughter, Nancy Richards Cavanaugh is joining him here. George, would you please stand so we can recognize you? In 1994, 
George and his late wife, Ann, endowed this award to honor George's father, Bart Richards, longtime editor of the Newcastle News in Pennsylvania. Bart Richards was, by all accounts, an extraordinary journalist and person. He started his journalism career in earnest as editor of an army publication called Trench and Camp at Camp Hancock, Georgia during World War I. Later, he joined the Newcastle News as a general assignment reporter in 1920. He was 27 years old. He worked his way up at that newspaper, covering multiple beats and moving to the city desk before becoming assistant editor and then editor of the paper. He was highly respected. He was one of the founders of the Pennsylvania Society of Newspaper Editors, and he was also president of United Press International Editors of Pennsylvania. He was known by his peers as a fearless, creative, and persistent journalist. I love this quote from Ed Vosberg, a Penn State journalism graduate who met Bart Richards in the 1950s and also worked at the Newcastle paper. Mr. Vosberg described him as a, quote, swashbuckling newspaper reporter with a great flair for writing, striving always to get the story first and present it vividly, regardless of the obstacles, at a time when reporters dug out facts on their own and sweat blood turning him into works of literary art. Bart Richards was at that paper exactly 43 years, retiring in May 1963. So we are grateful that George Richards has chosen to honor his father with this award. George, thank you for being our friend and giving us the opportunity each year to make this award, which has enabled us to recognize some of the most accomplished journalists in the U.S. And now, on to the award winner for this year. The Bart Richards Award for Media Criticism recognizes distinguished contributions to the improvement of print and electronic news journalism through responsible analysis or critical evaluation. It is, in, is, it is intended to encourage new, innovative approaches to constructive journalism or media criticism. Our winner this evening joins a list of distinguished previous recipients whose work has made an impact. Now we had three judges for the finalists, and they were Steve Guyman, he was here earlier and some of you know him. He's an editor for Bloomberg News and president of the SDX Foundation, which supports the educational mission of the Society of Professional Jur excuse me, Journalists. Tom Mateski, retired deputy news bureau chief for CBS News, with more than three decades experience as a reporter producer, and network executive. Tom teaches journalism at Georgetown University. And finally, Jackie Jones, who is with us tonight. She is chair of the Department of Multimedia Journalism at Morgan State University and a journalist with decades of experience at a range of publications, including Newsday, the Detroit Free Press, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the Washington Post, and more. Jackie, I'm not going to list all of them. And tonight, we are pleased to present the Bart Richards Award for Media Criticism to Neiman Reports, a quarterly print publication and website covering thought leadership and journalism. Neiman Reports is published by the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard. Neiman Reports submitted four in-depth stories on key issues in journalism and journalism education. Those topics were news media censorship in China, the future of foreign news, the dearth of women in journalism management and leadership, and, and I have to say of particular interest to the college, the evolving state of journalism education in the United States. You know, the judges were certainly impressed with your work. They noted the consistency in reporting, they noted the breadth and scope of the work, and its potential for impact. Tom Mateski, one of the judges, captured it this way. Quote, not only are the stories deeply researched, they're timely, informative, and well-written. They provide context and perspective about complicating, complicated issues affecting journalism and news reporting, and they provide insight into important questions that are being debated in newsrooms and journalism classrooms. Now, I can attest, the subjects of these stories are being discussed and debated in journalism classrooms, including ours. 
These stories are important to anyone with an interest in the future of journalism. Now we have three representatives of Neiman Reports with us tonight. James Geary, a 2012 Neiman Fellow, is editor of the magazine and deputy curator of the Neiman Foundation. Mr. Geary was a journalist in Europe for many years, including as Europe editor for Time Magazine, as editor of Ode, The Intelligent Optimist, and as founding editor-in-chief of the World Weekly Magazine in London. Jan Gardner, who is also a Sunday book columnist for the Boston Globe, is a senior editor, and Jonathan Seitz is, the, is, the, is a modern reporter, as I like to put it, for Neiman Reports. He writes, he shoots, he creates audio, he creates video, and he maintains the website for the foundation. So, on behalf of the College of Communications at Penn State, I am pleased and honored to present the Bart Richards Award for Media Criticism, which includes an honorarium and a lovely trophy to Neiman Reports. Neiman Reports. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dean Harden, for that um, uh, lovely introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the judges very much for um, choosing uh, Neiman Reports and for the comments which showed the care and the attention they devoted to reading our stories. And of course, I would like to thank Mr. George Richards for uh, starting this award, um, which we are so fortunate to um, receive. It's an honor to be here with you tonight and to receive this award, and I'm really delighted to accept the award on behalf of my colleagues, Jan and John. Um, <clears throat> Neiman Reports has been spared the, um, the spate of layoffs that's been plaguing the rest of the industry because it's just Jan, John, and I who make the magazine. <laughs> so if we laid anybody off, we'd have to shutter the place. I also want to acknowledge uh, Anne-Marie Lipinski, a Neiman curator and the publisher of, uh, of Neiman Reports. And I also want to especially acknowledge um, the writers that we work with, uh, one of whom is, is here uh, tonight, Jenny Bergal. Um, Jan, John, and I are the, uh, the editorial staff, so we work with freelancers who, who write uh, all, all the articles. And um, freelancers, like many other uh, sectors of the journalism industry, are going through a very hard time at the moment. And I want to acknowledge their invaluable contribution to, to this award, specifically the authors of the cover stories that Dean Harden cited, Paul Mooney, John Marcus, Joshua Hammer, Anna Griffin, and John Dyer. Um, I'd also like to be able to claim some small, closer connection to the Bart Richards Award, since, as um, Mr. Richards and I were discussing earlier, I, too, am a native Pennsylvanian. Um, not from the same side of, <laughs> that's right, let's hear it for Pennsylvania. Um, yes, let's, that was not a rhetorical remark. I'm from the opposite side of the state. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, but um, Pennsylvania is Pennsylvania. Um, also, uh, in addition, as Dean Harden was explaining about um, Mr. Richard's father, he was not only a great journalist, he was a local historian, he was also a poet. Uh, he published two volumes of poetry. And poetry is a, a very long-standing interest of mine. And in fact, we've published two articles in Neiman Reports about the relationship between poetry and journalism. Uh, one by Harvard professor uh, Stephen Burt uh, about why fine writing in both poetry, how fine writing in poetry and journalism is very, very similar. And um, most recently, we published a story about the epic free verse poem as a vehicle for narrative nonfiction journalism. Yes, you heard that right, the epic free verse poem <laughs> as a vehicle for narrative nonfiction journalism. There's a wonderful writer, writer called um, Russ Reimer who is telling a, a story of a, 19, I think it's 1970s murder in Copenhagen, um, uh, interwoven with um, memoiristic aspects of his own life, and he's writing it in free verse, epic free verse. So we're talking John Milton kind of epic free verse here. So, Mr. Richard, I, I hope your father would have approved of, of those two articles. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is just say a few brief words about um, Neiman Reports and about uh, our journalism, 
and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Um, as part of the uh, Neiman Foundation, we also run a journalism. Where's our, where's our, where's your husband? Is he here? Okay. Well, it's nice to see another uh, 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 Neiman alum in the audience. As you will no doubt remember, um, the Neiman Foundation, uh, in addition to publishing Neiman Reports, we run a fellowship program. And as part of that fellowship program, um, we have weekly seminars and conferences and events, um, often which feature uh, Harvard professors who come and talk to the fellows about their specialty. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just recovering from a cold, so my voice is a little bit low. Um, uh, we had our final um, seminar just two weeks ago, and it was um, with Jennifer Roberts, who's an art historian, a professor of art his history at Harvard. And we met at, Fo at the Fogg Museum, which has just been refurbished and reopened. It's an amazing place. If you're ever in Cambridge, you have to visit. And um, Jennifer Roberts has this idea called slow looking. And in her classes, she assigns her students to go to a museum, any museum, doesn't matter, choose an object, any object, it doesn't matter, and look at it for three hours, nonstop. She has a little sheet with a little sort of questions that serve as prompts for, for, for that examination. But the assignment is look at one object for three hours and then report back on what you see. And we did this exercise. Unfortunately, we didn't have three hours, so we compressed it into 10 minutes, but still. Uh, <laughs> it still works, but you really should do the three hours. Um, don't tell her I said that. Um, and we were looking at a painting by James Abbott McNeil Whistler, and uh, an American painter who uh, lived in Europe for a while. And it was a painting of uh, a stretch of the Thames River in London. And it's a beautiful, beautiful painting. Um, it's almost impressionistic. It's, it's got these beautiful horizontal brush strokes, and it's this gauzy blue. The sky and the water of the Thames are almost the same kind of gauzy blue. It's a very mysterious, intriguing, beautiful, beautiful painting. And you can see it's hard to tell in the painting whether it's sunrise or sunset, but it's some time of day where that something is either beginning or ending. And um, but you see a few buildings silhouetted against the, the background, one of which is obviously uh, a church steeple. Um, and then there's some other buildings there that you can't quite make out. And it's a gorgeous, really enthralling painting. But it was only after staring at it for 10 minutes that I realized those other unidentified shapes were actually slag heaps. Um, it was an in, it's an industrial site. There were smokestacks that looked like church spires, and it was an industrial site uh, in Battersea, South London. And that silver sheen on the, on the Thames River was not moonlight reflecting, but it was toxic sludge <laughs> from the slag heap. So it occurred to me, just passing that painting and looking at it, casually glancing at it, I'd never really discovered what it was, was really about. It was only this close, slow looking that revealed the true, the true meaning, and I would ar also argue the true beauty of that painting. And I like to think that's what we do at Neiman Reports. Um, we have a very lively uh, online web presence, um, but we, we spend most of our editorial um, energy on the feature stories in, the quarter, in our quarterly publication. And having a quarterly publication, which also appears in print in this age of the nanosecond news cycle may, may seem anachronistic. But, um, and this is one of the things that so pleased us by, about the judges' remarks is um, they mentioned the depth of research um, that goes into our stories. And that, can, that kind of story can only be done slowly. Um, and you need to spend time reporting. You need to spend time researching. And it's only when you look at journalism through slow looking, paying careful attention, that you can see what maybe looks uh, on the surface to be one way is actually another way if you pay close enough attention. Now, a lot of people have been describing journalism as a kind of a slag heap <laughs> recently, but what I'd like to just share with you briefly now are a few observations that we've made about, uh, about the stories and about the subjects that we've covered that through this 
kind of slow, close, slow journalism, close looking, um, are perhaps more optimistic and hopeful than, um, than we read about um, in a lot of other um, media criticism. So <clears throat> the, um, I think the first lesson is that good journalism is still about stories. It's still about quality storytelling. Um, uh, Dean, Dean Harden mentioned our, our cover story on the uh, future of J schools. And one of the things I think we learned from uh, editing and reporting that uh, story was that journalism's problems are journalism schools' problems, too. They have the same challenges. They face the same um, difficulties. They face the same, in many ways, financial uh, uh, and editorial challenges. Um, and they're both reaching the same kind of inflection point in regard to their future. <laughs> Basically, change or die. <laughs> um, and journalism schools are changing. That's what our cover story really showed. And they're changing in really, really exciting and interesting ways. Um, just to give you one example, at Northeastern University, which is right nearby us, um, I don't think it's Harvard, but it's also a university. Um, <laughs> Um, they, um, they have a, a program whereby um, students in one class are working with uh, editors at Esquire to revive articles from Esquire's archives. So some of you may recall, I forget how long ago, four or five, six years ago, Luke Dietrich's story, Walking the Border, where he actually spent, I don't know how long, walking the full length of the uh, U.S.-Mexico border. And this was published in Esquire as an 8,000-word piece of, of narrative journalism. And the students at Northeastern have turned his story, which is you know, only available now in, in the Esquire archives, they turned it into a video game where you can be Luke Dietrich walking across the U.S.-Mexico border, dodging drug smugglers and people smugglers and trying, trying to find a place to uh, camp for the night because Luke walked the entire route. He didn't, he didn't take any other form of transportation. Um, they've turned it into a crowdsourced version where people who live along the route, they can contribute stories at the geographic location that Luke is at that moment in the story. They also made it into an interactive map so that you can zoom in and out of specific parts of the story based on its geographic location. So the, the assignment for these journalism students was to reimagine storytelling digitally. And I think there's a lot to admire uh, in this exercise. First of all, it takes uh, archival content, which is just kind of sitting, uh, sitting there, waiting to be discovered, gives it a new life, exposes it to a new audience. Specifically an audience, a younger audience. And, um, you know, people can and do deride gamification of journalism but it has a very interesting effect on a certain demographic. It gets them interested in the news. And I think anything that gets people interested in the news, especially younger people, is a good thing. Um, it's also a potential way to monetize uh, archival content, because you could offer a premium subscription where you have access to the archives and all this extra, extra rich uh, digital content around it. But what I also admire about this initiative is that it wouldn't amount to anything if Luke's original story wasn't good, wasn't great, in fact. The, the, the reporting and the storytelling that he did in that piece was so rich that it can support all these other expressions. And I think that's um, a key point about journalism schools, and we were sort of talking about this uh, earlier. Pa over the past few weeks, I've been reading pieces about something of a backlash against the focus on digital at, at J schools, that storytelling and the mechanics and the basics of, of good writing and reporting were being left behind. And I think that's um, a key area that we discovered is still um, alive and well, that the, the discipline of storytelling, whether you're writing an 8,000 word piece or making an interactive map or a video game, the principles are the same. Um, there's narrative arc, there's characterization, uh, there's drama, suspense, and there's good reporting. So I think um, one of the things that we learned from, from, from that story is that the fundamentals matter and that storytelling still matters. Another fundamental, and this is something that John Marcus, who wrote the, the J School story, um, said to me, 
uh, is mentoring. Mentorship matters. Um, John said to me, the apprenticeship model by which I learn so much from more experienced journalists and editors is gone. Those people in newsrooms who have institutional experience were the first to be offered buyouts or are so busy that they don't have time to spend with younger writers. So the journalists in the audience, I'm sure you each have a mentor mentorship experience. Mine is sitting here, he's Jay Brannigan, who, who used to work uh, with me at, at Time Magazine. And when I was a, a young stringer, uh, working in the hotbed of breaking news that is the Netherlands, uh, <laughs> Jay was my boss, he was the bureau chief in Brussels. And he showed me the ropes about how to navigate the Time bureaucracy and how the editing process there worked. And very importantly, he, he indoctrinated me into the rigors of time style, which is a very specific form of, of writing. <laughs> um, and without Jay, I would, um, I would have not had the, the career that I had at time. So thanks, Jay. Um, mentorship uh, is key. And that was also a, a conclusion that came out of our cover story on female newsroom leadership. Not having enough wi woman, wi women in uh, editorial positions in, um, uh, in newsrooms makes it harder for women to rise up in the organization. They don't have the role models, they don't have the examples, and they don't have the people looking out for them, like Jay looked out for me. So on reporting uh, this story, Anna Griffin, who, who wrote the piece, she, she said to me that um, the experience of writing and re reporting the story reinforced my sense that female leaders are still he held to a very different, if subconscious for the most part, standard than men. As an industry, we have a diversity problem that makes doing our fundamental job, accurately reflecting the communities we cover, much harder. So mentoring, I think, is key to, to solving those problems. And this is something we're discovering again in a story we're working on now, um, our cover story for our next issue on racial and ethnic diversity in newsrooms. And that's a story that I hope the judges will be spending a close, paying close attention to uh, next year. <laughs> so um, another cover story was on foreign reporting, foreign correspondence, which has been much in the news recently with ISIS and Iraq and Greece and Ukraine. Um, legacy media like Time Magazine uh, have pulled back. When I edited the European edition of Time, there were 75 uh, correspondents and photo editors and all kinds of people in the Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and now there are three. That's just one example of how far the cuts have, have gone in, in the mainstream legacy news industry. But just like <laughs> looking at that Whistler painting, you can see some beauty in the ugliness. Um, there's also, as our, as our story showed, all kinds of new freelance organizations springing up, um, organizations that provide freelancers with uh, hazardous environment training, with evacuation insurance, um, taking on the role that newsrooms used to have and bureau chiefs used to have. And I think that's um, a very encouraging sign because a lot of the international coverage is falling on the shoulders of daring freelancers. Um, at the same time, organizations like Vice and Quartz, um, Huffington Post, are doing more and more foreign coverage. And uh, Joshua Hammer, who was a correspondent, longtime foreign correspondent for a, a, a magazine, I think it was called Newsweek, something like that, I'm not sure. Um, he, uh, he himself said, I hadn't realized how much foreign reporting by these digital outlets was going on. He was pleasantly surprised by that. And so Vice is a really good example, and Vice is regularly criticized for uh, sensationalizing uh, coverage, for putting the correspondent in front as the more important focus of the story rather than the story itself. And I think um, that may or may not be true. Um, and again, as with video games or gamification of journalism, I have a 20-year-old son who knows a lot about Ukraine because he watches Vice documentaries. So he doesn't know about Ukraine because he reads Time or the New York Times. He knows it because he watches Vice videos. I think that's important. He's also a vegetarian because he watched a Vice video <laughs> about uh, farming, uh, meat farming in, in, in America. Um, I haven't watched that video yet. Um, <laughs> 
and I don't intend to. Um, so as to the charge of sensationalism and putting the correspondent first, I think that might be true in some cases, but I would hasten to point out that that is not a problem unique to digital media. If you think of the Brian Williams case, what is that but sens sensationalization and putting the correspondent before the story? So these are inherent risks in journalism. They're not risks or deficiencies uh, unique to dig uh, the digital form. Jonah Peretti, who's the founder of, of BuzzFeed, is very, very passionate and committed to uh, foreign co coverage. And the way he talks about it reminds me of another um, a media empire builder, a builder called Henry Luce. And if you look back when, uh, when Time was founded, I'm blanking on the date, 1926, 1923, 1923, um, it was an aggregator. Time writers in 1923 were rewriting wire copy and publishing it in the magazine. They're all very short articles and they're all based on other people's reporting. Over the years, Time began doing its own reporting and its own investigations and it had its own foreign correspondence, but it started out basically as an aggregator. And that's exactly how these digital outlets are starting, have started. And now you see them climbing up the value chain. And I think that's the, the third lesson that we learned from the, the, the foreign correspondence uh, story in particular, that we need to keep climbing the value chain. Um, Vice, uh, BuzzFeed started out with a bunch of short clickbaits and listicles. It's now doing serious and sub substantive uh, foreign reporting. That's a very good thing, especially, especially if it's attracting audiences uh, of the age of my son. Um, so foreign correspondents are also more vulnerable, uh, partly because, because they're, they're less indispensable. Um, organizations like ISIS don't need for, for us foreign correspondents to get their message out anymore, plus anybody with a mobile phone and a cell connection is potentially a journalist. And I think citizen, citizen journalism is a really important trend. Um, and it brings me to our fourth and final cover story, which was the story on journalism in China. And the lesson we learned, uh, or yeah, the lesson we learned from that, I have to say in Chinese, it's too long fa shu, <laughs> which anybody speak Chinese? We probably wouldn't recognize my pronunciation anyway, but it means, it translates roughly as lacking the skill to slay the dragon. And it's a Chinese expression that you use when you feel inadequate to a, to a task. So like this winter, when I woke up and saw eight feet of snow outside my window, I felt too long fa shu in terms of being able to shovel all that stuff off, off my sidewalk. Um, I first heard this phrase from a, a Chinese fellow uh, a year ago named Yang Xiao. And he was referring to himself and his, I guess his self-questioning whether he had the, the determination to remain being a journalist in China when it was so hard to work there. Not just because of the censorship of the government, but the self-censorship that out of safety, um, many journalists feel compelled to, to uh, employ. Yang Xiao wrote one of the pieces in this cover package uh, and it's all about that, um, um, whether you know, he was actually telling the truth or compromising himself by coming up with all these creative ways to tell the truth slant. Um, so what's fascinating about journalism in China is that the Chinese, both the citizen journalists and the professional journalists, are coming up with so many amazing ways to get around the censors. For example, in China, I don't know if anybody knows this, but May has 35 days. Um, that's because all mention of June 4th online is immediately deleted. So June 4th is, of course, the date of Tiananmen Square. Whenever Chinese journalists want to reference that date, they say May 35th, which is four days after the end of May, which is the May 31st. There's all these really amazingly creative and clever linguistic ways that they get around the censors, but the censors are also um, very, very clever, and they pick up on these tricks. Um, another great example is uh, there was a, uh, a government official who was under investigation for corruption, and you were not allowed to mention his name uh, uh, online or at all. And um, one of the syllables in his name is Kong, 
and there are also happens to be uh, a brand of instant noodles called Master Kong. And so whenever anybody wanted to talk about him or write a story about him, they would say Master Kong, meaning these, this brand of noodles. And so it got through the, uh, the censors until they caught on. This is also a little side story. The actual cover of, the, of that issue of the magazine is a package of the very same Master Kong noodles, <laughs> which John Seitz went to the ends of the earth to try and find and ended up finding it in a Chinese grocery store across the river in Boston. So if there's ever a journalism award, award for the most effort in getting a cover image, I think John deserves to get it. So I mentioned Yang Xiao and, 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 um, uh, and the state of Chinese journalism because I think about him a lot uh, uh, when I think about the, the challenges and the problems that, um, uh, that we face uh, as journalists uh, in, the, in the West. Um, and I think about him because I find his example and I find uh, the example of uh, other Chinese journalists and many, many of the people that we profiled in, in these cover, cover stories um, really inspiring and um, their determination and creativity in addressing uh, the challenges that face our industry um, make me feel pretty optimistic that we will sometime soon end up slaying uh, our own dragons. So thank you again for the honor of this award, and thank you, Mr. Richard, for creating it. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. OK, good, thanks. <laughs> yes, sir. No, we're not. Um, we have, uh, the Neiman Foundation was founded 78 years ago um, when <clears throat> a woman named Agnes Neiman, who was the, the wife, the widow of a Midwestern newspaper editor, um, gave Harvard roughly a million dollars when she died. And her um, only instruction was that um, Harvard use the money to promote and enhance the state of journalism. That's a pretty wide remit. And there were Walter Lippmann at that time, this was 1930, John is also our local um, Neiman historian, 1937, yeah, 1937. Um, Walter Lippmann was a Harvard grad and he was uh, on the board of advisors or something like that. So there was a very high level discussion about what to do with the money because there was no real instruction other than to promote journalism. One idea was to uh, create a an archive of, um, uh, what's that, microfilm, um, 1937. So um, create an archive with every single newspaper in the entire world on microfilm. And that's where the title of curator actually comes from, because the person who would have been in charge of that collection would have been the curator of that collection. So Anne-Marie Lipinski is the curator, and I'm the deputy curator, which is an odd title. Um, but if you know the history, it makes sense. So Walter Lippmann was one of the people who said, that's probably not a really good idea. Let's have a fellowship instead. And uh, Dean Harden and I were talking earlier about there was lots of resistance um, from academics at that time because 1937, very, very few newspaper reporters were college graduates. They had a reputation of being hard drinking um, people who used not very nice words um, in the newsroom. Um, but that, that uh, idea of a fellowship was accepted and the first class was, was accepted uh, um, the next year. And so the, Harvard, the Neiman Endowment is separate from Harvard's funding. It's really completely separate. And the, the original funds that Agnes Neiman gave to Harvard fund our, 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 our activities, including Neiman Reports, among many other things. And we must take comfort in that fact.
I think we're probably shooting ourselves in another part of the anatomy, which is more crucial to our long-term survival. Um, well, I think it's true that um, there, there, ha there have been and, and always are really high-profile um, high profile scandals or mistakes or, or whatever that really dent public conf confidence in, in journalism. I lived in Europe for a long time in, in London, and the, the phone hacking scandal there is just absolutely despicable. It's just despicable. And to think that these people call themselves journalists who, who, who are doing that is just unbelievable. Um, and of course the public is, of course you lose trust in the, in, in the press um, when you hear things like that, or Brian Williams, or the Rolling Stone thing, or even George Stephanop. Stephanopoulos and his donation to the Clinton Foundation. Um, I think the, there's no other answer except to uphold our own basic values, to, to live by you know, the watchdog journalism that we do on other people, corrupt city councillors or um, you know, shady business deals. You know, any journalist will be rabidly going after a story like that, I think we need to hold ourselves to the, to the same kind of standard. And I think um, that's one thing. And the only other thing, I mean, what else can we do is to do really good stories uh, that matter to people. And so if you look at the reporting on the NSA and the surveillance and uh, Edward Snowden, it's puzzling because, you know, something like Brian Williams will, will get a lot of attention. but. Um, the what's going on with government surveillance of our lives does not provoke the same degree of outrage for, for some reason. So I think um, it's a two-way street. Surely we journalists have made mistakes and we can do better and we should do better. Um, but I also think, and I don't know how to explain it, the public has become a little bit numbed to 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 the revelations that are brought out by really good investigative journalism. And I don't know how to explain that. I don't know whether that's um, just a product of the, the, the nanosecond news cycle or the product of just so many political scandals that you think, yeah, okay, so the government's spying on us. Okay, tell me something I don't already know. Um, but the stakes are really, really high. Um, for a lot of stories, not just government surveillance, but coverage of the environment, um, foreign correspondence, foreign stories, foreign reporting, what's going on in uh, Ukraine and Russia, um, the, fi the financial situation of the EU. All these are really, really important stories, and we need to make, make people care about them and make them care about them as much as they care about Brian Williams or something like that. And so the, the hopefulness I see in, in that regard are... are some of the things that I said before, like my son, you know, trying to appeal because he's uh, he's going to be a voter next year. He's he's going to be a, he is a news consumer, <laughs> um, so we need to reach those audiences and make them care. And any outlet that does that and does it with good, responsible journalism, I'm all for it. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's a really good question because I think ideas, um, it starts with the idea, right? You can have great writers and, and great reporters and execute those ideas, but you need to have the ideas first. And what's, what I think is interesting about um, the cover stories that the judges cited in, in giving us this award is that they're all kind of old chestnuts. 
like the future of J schools, the future of foreign reporting, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all read a million stories about those subjects. Um, the lack of female newsroom leadership, they're all very, very familiar topics. So what Jan and John and I saw as our challenge was to how can we do those stories in a new way, in a fresh way, um, and um, actually say something that people haven't already heard and they're not gonna just roll their eyes about. So the, the female newsroom leadership story, for example, we really worked hard with the help of a, a couple really smart interns to find actual studies that looked at what happens when a male is in charge of a newsroom and a female is in charge of a newsroom. It doesn't make any quantitative or qualitative difference whatsoever. And the few studies that we found suggest that it does. Um, one, of the, one of the findings for one of the studies was that a, a wider variety of sources was used when a woman was uh, running the newsroom, was editing the story. So not just the Harvard professor, or not just the government economist, but um, a taxi driver or, you know, or even an economist who's not from Harvard <laughs> or the government. So um, another study found that the newsroom environment itself was more collaborative and open and there was more teamwork. So um, there's not a lot of these kind of studies, but the ones that we found did suggest that it made a, a substantive difference, which I think is fascinating. And I don't know, we hadn't seen that in any of the, the stories that, that we had looked at in, in researching. So in some cases, the ideas are just old ones. They're kind of, it's like I said, the slow looking. It's like you say to me, the lack of women journalism leaders, and I think, yeah, I know that story. Well, actually, if you look at it longer, it turns out you don't know the story. There's a lot more to it. Um, so that's one way we get ideas. And then Jan and John and I have our own ideas, and we really encourage um, uh, the freelancers. Well, we, we, we've got a kind of pool of regular contributors, and they know us, and we know them, and they know the kind of stories we like. So um, it's great when we get um, suggestions from, uh, from people who aren't us, because <laughs> just three, three minds is not enough. <laughs> you know, you need many, many minds. So if anyone has any story ideas, please see me afterwards, or <laughs> it's a dollar a word. <laughs> okay, we'll join the club. Um, we, so we are a quarterly magazine, and we do appear in print, but we, have, um, we spend a lot of time um, uh, kind of honing and fine-tuning the way we present stories digitally. So we just redesigned our website a year, year and a half ago, and um, we were actually talking earlier with one of the judges about the advantages of print, what you can do, in, there's certain things you can do in print that you just can't do online. And for me, I, I've, al I've always been a magazine guy. I love the physical object of a magazine. I think it can be a work of art that exists and deserves to exist in a physical form. I also think digital journalism is fabulous. And there's things you can do online that you can't do in print. And you should do online. And you shouldn't do in print. So one way we do that is for the foreign correspondence story, we had this uh, graphic in the magazine about we, we, we got all the income and expenses for one freelancer over, was it a period of a month or three months? Or like a, he did a, or she did a couple stories over a three month period. And we were fortunate enough that he gave us his uh, income and ex his profit and loss sheet. So in the magazine, we did a little chart. This is how much he made, this is how much he spent online. Uh, we worked with a, a designer who did a great, a great little thing. It's very simple, but it's fun. And it's just like a, a rectangle of dots. And it started out full um, with the amount of money that he made. I think it was like $9,000 or something like that. And then all the expenses came in, and gradually all the dots started turning red <laughs> and dropping off the, off the page. So you'd see travel, $1,500, meals, $2,000. A flak jacket, $350, and you know, by the end, there's just like two or three measly dots, and the guy made basically no money as a result uh, of all his hard work. 
So there's lots of things. To, we, we also had a, did a story on comics journalism, uh, which appeared as a comic in the magazine, but online it was animated. And it actually you know, had little animated effects, which was really cool. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do online um, <clears throat> to, uh, to, 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 you know, to just show a story in a different way and to tell a different part of a story in a better way. And social media has been great for us. Um, the, the, the story about female newsroom leadership, one way that we use it, I mean, this is just like a publicity strategy. When we, gosh, we interviewed maybe 40 or 50 people for that um, female newsroom leadership uh, piece. And when the piece came out, we emailed every single one of them and said, the piece is out. Can you please tweet it to your, um, to your network and to your, your, your contacts? So we do that for every story, every cover story. And that has a sort of network effect. And you start reaching, because each of those, in, in that case, each of those people was a rather well-connected uh, female newsroom leader who knew lots of other well-connected female <laughs> newsroom leaders who would be interested in the subject of our story. So doing a very sort of deliberate and focused um, outreach around, but it's around content. I mean, what we're tweeting is that story. We're not just tweeting, here's a picture or something like that. We're tweeting, this is the story that we want you to spend, you know, 30 minutes reading. Um, and that, that's, that's worked really well for us.